I'll never forget where I was 22 years ago tomorrow. I was driving my kids to school, and uh, we heard on the radio a plane just accidentally flew into the World Trade, World Trade Center, one of, the, one of the Twin Towers. And, you know, it, it uh, flew, it, it hit that, so everyone's thinking, oh, it must be a malfunction. But then a second plane flew into the other tower in the other direction. And we realized we were under attack. And I don't know if you were alive during that time or if you remember during that time, but all day long we just kept seeing that image of the plane flying into the tower, plane flying into the tower, and then the whole, the, each tower collapsing one at a time. And just the horror after horror that we saw, uh, not only on that day, but on the days to come. And I remember uh, just one scene of the people who survived, who got out of the buildings in time, uh, running away from, from the, the ground zero, and they look back over their shoulder to see billows of smoke. There's just this cloud of smoke and dirt and ash going down the city streets and just covering everything. And suddenly, we didn't feel safe on American soil. That's unusual for us for in, in, in my lifetime. I remember specifically one day, uh, just after 9-11, I went out to get the mail at, at my house. The mailbox was, it's a neighborhood one, it's a little, little ways away, so I'm walking over to get the mail when a little plane flew overhead, and suddenly I was afraid of a plane. Our lives had forever changed. In the Bible, we read uh, uh, about something that happened six centuries before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Attackers from a foreign country, Babylon, broke down the walls of Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple of the living God and broke down the city walls. And the Jewish people witnessed horror after horror. They probably felt like we felt on 9-11. And as the enemy came in, he captured the leaders, captured the royalty, captured the priests, and they, they took them away. And as they left, they looked back over their shoulder to see the holy city up with billows of smoke and dirt and ash. They saw horror after horror, and that was forever etched on their minds. But there's some good news. Seventy years later, after that attack, God kept his promise to the people of Israel. And God stirred up the heart of a heathen king, a, a guy that was not a believer in the living God, not a Jewish guy for sure, a, the, a, foreign, a foreign king. And he stirred up the heart of that king. And that king said, I'm going to set the captives free. And I'm going to fund their mission to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. And then God stirred up the leaders, the Jewish people who had now been gone for 70 years. And uh, some of them still, uh, many of them still alive, but then also the next generation. And God stirred up their hearts to leave that place that they had now settled in and go back to Jerusalem to start rebuilding and they rebuilt the altar where they used to sacrifice animals to pay for their sin. They sacrificed animals to God there at the temple. They rebuilt the temple. That was next. And hope began to arise in God's people. Wow, maybe we could be a worshiping community again. Maybe we could uh, serve God in the way he's asking us to again. They, they re rebuilt their faith in God. And Ezra, the priest who had come from Babylon, he'd come, a Jewish guy, a Jewish priest, he came back from Babylon, and he, he, he began to lead the worship community, and he helped them to renew their passion for God. And then Nehemiah came, another Jewish leader, and he came and started rebuilding the city wall uh, around Jerusalem. When those walls were, were down, the city was disgraced and vulnerable, and they began to see, wow, God is doing something here, and God did it. A miracle with the wall. This group of volunteers rebuilt the wall, a city wall, in 52 days. That was a miracle. 
Like, it wasn't like a construction crew who knew what they're doing came in. They came in to rubble. All the stones uh, torn, torn uh, down and, and all askew, the gates were burned. They came into rubble and they rebuilt it to the glory of God. I want to continue on with the, with the message. That's just a little bit of recap of message I brought last week. But I, I want to go on from there. If you have a Bible, would you take it out? If it's on your smartphone or device, that's great. Or if you brought a Bible with you, great. But it's good to get God's word in your hand. It's Nehemiah chapter 8. Verses 1 to 6. So now you know where the, the name of this little section of the Bible comes from, Nehemiah. It's the leader that came back, Jewish leader, to come back to rebuild the walls. If you don't know where Nehemiah is, look at the table of contents. That's really the easiest, quickest way, and it'll tell you the page number to get there. If you're on a smartphone, then you just scroll down, find Nehemiah, and then find chapter 8. So we're going to come back to that in just a moment while you're finding it. So today, we're continuing on with this, this thought, this series, this this um, direction that is from the Lord, I believe, for our church called Building Hope and Life. We're building hope and life together. Not just building hope and life church, but that too. But we're building hope and life. And the race is on to finish our building. It's been a long season. First, there was a long season of planning and architect and meetings and all that kind of stuff. And now there's been a long season of construction. And what we've been doing it's not that glamorous. We've been saw cutting concrete, uh, you know, putting uh, um, new pipes in the ground, running cables overhead, uh, putting up new walls, and it, it's it's uh, it's those those things that is the structure. It's like the stability. You got to have that. So we've been about three months intensely working on that part of things, but finally, we're to the finish stage where we're starting to paint. This is really cool, and so one of, the, one of the first things that was done is the priming of all the walls, and it's interesting that that priming revealed some flaws in the, in the taping and texturing. It, it revealed some inconsistencies and some little flaws, but we want to look good, so this weekend, we, and I say the, the ones who were actually spreading the mud, which is, I was not a mud spreader yesterday, uh, but uh, they, they, we, we love those walls. So they went in and just lovingly put mud over those places that need to be spruced up, and then, then we painted. And uh, so we, we, we care about those walls. They were not in perfect condition. We got them better. Then we painted, and we saw more flaws. And it's a process. It's, it's a process that takes some patience. But with each step that we took, those walls looking a little bit more beautiful. And I believe that every wall we paint is a prophecy. It's a prophecy that in this place, within these walls, there are going to be people with flaws like me who come here and we seek God together, and he puts a little, a little mud and taping on our lives where needed. He, he says, okay, I can see that, yes, and I'm going to fix that thing. And he fixes a little, and we, we are just going, praise God, so much is fixed in my life. And now we can see a little bit more. God can see, okay, okay my child, okay, my son, okay, my daughter, we fix that thing. Now let's move on here. Let's be more and more like Jesus. And I, I just believe that every wall we paint is a prophecy that, that lives are going to be healed, repaired, restored, made beautiful, just like those walls. Now it's, it's a process. Uh, but I, I believe, and I just I would just want to speak life into this, that there are going to be people in this place who are set free from addiction. There are going to be people in this place who are set free from depression and anxiety, set free from generational curses, we call them, where it seems like the same, same issue uh, surfaces again and again in generation to generation. That's going to be broken off in Jesus' name, broken lives restored. I, I can see it in my mind, and the walls are kind of like a, a, an illustration of it. Now, that takes effort. That takes a paint party. You know what I'm talking about? Like that takes a church working together to support someone who, is, who was very, very broken to become very, very healed and very, very whole. It's, sometimes that process is a, is a step forward 
and then a step back and a step forward and a step back. But we, we've done it for years. We walk with people who are stepping forward and stepping back like me. I, it seems like I make a little progress in an area, and then I just fall back a little bit in an area. But we're together. We're doing that together. We're supporting it together. And within these walls, lives are, are, are being repaired, restored, and beautified, and they will be going forward. Amen? I believe it. We, I just call forth beauty in families that are broken. And God just begins to repair that family he just begins to repair hearts. He begins to repair relationships. And families are restored in Jesus' name within these walls. Now and in the future. I just foresee in the future that kids who are being abused are rescued. And they're brought into safety. Their, their lives and their destinies are changed. And you know when you change a kid's destiny, you also change their kid's destiny and their kids' destiny, and their kids' destiny to a thousand generations of those who love the Lord. That's what's going to happen in these walls. And it's been happening, but it's going to increase in Jesus' name. I can see it, and I believe it. So really, we talk a lot about the, the building because it's just so in our face, and we just need to get this tool ready and done, but it is only a tool for ministry. And we're eventually going to use every square inch of this property for ministry. There used to be back halls and garages and attics. But those are all going to be ministry spaces in Jesus' name going forward. So we're, as we're building hope and life, we're going to finish our building. We're going to finish our church. But I believe that God wants to do a deeper work in you and in me, in our hearts, in our lives, and in our minds so may God deepen our passion. We're going to finish our church, deepen our passion. And I love that, I, I, talk, I talked about this last, last week, that God stirs up your passion for him in order to bring out the best in you. So God's doing a work in you, but he's got something good to do through you. In the Bible, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, it says this, For God is working in you. Someone say, God's working in me. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. It's hard. So I'm not going to sugarcoat it. If you're going to follow Jesus, it's hard because it's saying uh, yes to some things you would not normally do, saying no to some things you would normally want to do, and that's hard. But God is working in you, giving you the desire to do that, to get there, to take that one step forward, even if it's another step back. And he's given you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. So we're not walking around depressed and frustrated. Oh, I just cannot live for God in the way I want to. What we're doing instead is we're speaking God's word. And we're saying, God has given me the desire. God has given me the power. And I can do what pleases him. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's, that's what God is doing in us. And he wants to deepen our passion. So today I want to talk to you about passionate pursuit. Passionate pursuit. Okay, so now I'm going to go to, to Nehemiah chapter 8. And it's a long passage. I'm not going to read it all, but let me just tell you what's happening here. So all of God's people, they've come back out of captivity. They come back to Jerusalem. They built the altar. They, they rebuilt the temple. They rebuilt the wall. It's, it all just got done. And they all come together. And the Bible makes a point of telling us they this whole big group of people, men, women, children, thousands, come together. In, they gather in this public square, and they come with one thing on their mind, and that one thing only. I want to hear God's voice. I want to hear from God. I want to hear him speak to me. I want to hear him guide me. I want to hear him and know that he's with me, that he cares about me, that he's nearby. And they all came together to hear God speak. They craved the word of the Lord. They hungered and thirsted for God's presence and God's word. And so they asked Ezra. Remember Ezra? They asked Ezra. The, the, the biblical scholar guy to bring out the book of the law of Moses. 
Now, we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. New Testament's about Jesus, and it's kind of that time forward. They only had the Old Testament then, which was the law. It was a whole book where God was showing us, here's here's where mankind fell away from me, here's what I'm doing to bring you back, and here's my standard, perfect holiness. It was, it's an intimidating book. But they, 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 they asked Ezra, would you read it to us? Because they had no printing presses. Most people did not have the Bible in their hands. They didn't have the privilege that we do today. And so they relied, and in fact, most of them were illiterate. Most of the common, unstudied uh, people, if you weren't a priest, you were probably illiterate. And so they said, we have got to hear God's word. Ezra, would you read it to us? So they, they, they gathered, and they, it, it had been a while. We want to hear them. And the Bible says that when they saw Ezra open the book of the law. So you, you, you and I think when he opened a book, we'd go like this. Now, it was a scroll. That, that was the book. So he, so he opened the scroll. He opened the book of the law. And when they saw him open the book, They rose to their feet. All of a sudden, this was not casual time. All of a sudden, they stood to their feet. No one had to ask them. They leaned in. What is God going to say to us through his word today? We want to hear God's voice. They passionately, intently listened to the word of God. And Ezra read the Bible out loud, get this, from early morning until noon. So, Early morning, I would say typically in that culture, it's probably 6 a.m. So from 6 a.m. to noon, six hours, the people stood to their feet, leaning in, just hanging on every word from God's mouth as it was read aloud to them. Can you imagine standing for six hours, men, women, children, listening to God's word, so hungry that they feel fed spiritually as they hear it? They heard God's word that God loves them. I think it might be um, uh, Deuteronomy, the first place in the, Bible, in the Old Testament that's where God says, I love you, and I want you to love me. He'd been telling the whole history of mankind, but finally, in the book of the law, he says, I want you to know, I'm doing all this because I love you. They also heard God's word that God has some standards for them. And these are some pretty high standards. What we learn from the book of the law, the Old Testament, is that God cares about every single thing in your life. And God hallows all of life. God makes holy, like every bit of it matters to him. Your relationships with yourself, with others, your marriage, your work, every bit of it matters to God. God loves you that much. that He, be, he God said, and here are my standards for every little area. Uh, so back then, not a lot of BLTs happening, if you know what I'm saying. No, no pork. <laughs> that was, God even cared about what they ate and how they ate it. Like, wow. So they're listening and they, they're, they're hearing God's word give them promises. Like one, one of the promises I mentioned, 70 years. Your captivity is no more than 70 years. And they, they heard God's warnings through the prophets being read. And the Bible tells us, down in verse 9, I'm not going not gonna to read it, but the Bible says, and they wept aloud. They were so moved by the word of God and by what God was saying for them and how God wanted to be involved in every part of their life and how God loved them. They were so moved that these thousands of people gathered together to only hear from God. They started weeping. And I bet probably for many reasons they probably wept for joy. (sighs) We finally hear the word of God again. They probably wept in like, oh, because I realize I have not been living the way God called out for me to live. And then verse 6, I love the response to God's word. Nehemiah 8, 6. Then Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people chanted, amen, amen. So you know how like you go to a soccer game, ole, 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 ole. Everyone's like, they just do it together. Can you imagine, and could we just try a little experiment? Could we just chant amen and don't stop until I say it? Okay, go, amen, 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 amen. That's, that just went on. The, Ezra reads God's word. He starts praising the great God. The people are like, amen. And you know, you know what amen means? It means I agree. 
You said it. Preach that. You bet. That's great. I'll say yes, that's great. In fact, let's just do this. If you're in the front half of the church on this side, would you say, I agree? Okay, give me a shot. Go for it. I agree. Yeah, and right back there, you say, uh, you bet. You bet. Like, you bet. Like, yeah, you got it. Say it. Go, go for it. Woo, that's the power section right there. I love it. Then the last half of the, of the church over on this side, why don't you guys say, you say that. You say that. Yeah, oh, that's good, all right? And then you guys right up here, what's left, what's left? Did, uh, did we already say, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, give it a try, I'll say. Okay, all at once, go. Your own, th- your own thing that you say. <laughs> it's a choir. Okay, ready? Four different things at once, go. Woo, yes. That's exactly how it felt right there. That's powerful. Everyone's like, Whoa! They, they, it was not, it, it was a very active, engaged encounter with God's word and God's voice. So Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people chanted, amen, amen, as they lifted their hands. No one told them. They were just like, oh, I'm just so moved by hearing God's word. They just raised their hands to God in, in surrender, in praise to God. And then they worship, they bowed down. And they worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. So everything is going on here. They've heard the word of God for the first time in a really long time. It's, suddenly God feels near again. They, they don't feel abandoned. They realize God was there all along and he's still there now. They, they, they just start sh- shouting, amen, I agree. I'll live by it. I'll do it. Thank you, God, for being here. And then they just worship God with their hands up. And then they were like, oh, oh, I just love you so much, God. And I know I need to surrender to you. So they bow down on the ground, their faces to the ground in worship. No one is telling them to do this. They're just responding passionately to the word of God. Something happened there. Something happened. It was not just simply reading a book. This was God's word going forth, and it was changing lives. It was, it was getting a hold of their heart. And these people, they, they had rebuilt the place of worship, the physical place, the altar, the temple, the four walls. They had rebuilt that, and then they actually worshiped. It's one thing to build a church or to build a building. It's another thing to actually worship. And that's what happens in the place of worship. These people brought a sacrifice of praise, the Bible calls it, and they laid their own heart on the altar to God. They said, God, I'm surrendering to you. Raising your hands. One meaning of that is surrender. Uh, also bowing down on, your, on the ground with your face to the ground before, uh, before God. It's, it's surrender. It's saying, you are great. You are Lord. You are King of kings, and I am not. I am submitting my life, my heart, my everything to you. Holy surrendered, as we sang earlier. They dug into God's word. They listened. They responded. They engaged. They shouted. Amen. I'll say. They were into it. They bowed down. They, they got their bodies into it. They got their mouths into it. And they just engaged with God passionately. And the good news is that God wants to be found when you passionately pursue him. God wants to be found. God is not trying to hide. I believe many times God, it feels like God is hiding because we are not passionately pursuing him. He wants to be wanted. The reason we want to be wanted is because we are like God. We are made in his image. We, we take after him. We're relational because God is relational. That, that, that's why, that's the way it went. It started with him. God wants to be found. God does not want to hide from you. He doesn't want you to feel like God is silent. He doesn't want you to struggle to hear the voice of God. He wants to speak to you. In fact, he is speaking to you, I believe, all the time. We just don't always turn on the receiver. We're just not in a posture to to pursue him. But when you passionately pursue the Lord, he wants to be found by you. God stirs up your passion, as I talked about a lot last week. And then God responds when you get passionate, as I'm talking about this week. When you say, when you initiate and you say, I got to have your word, God. I cannot go another day without feeling like I have heard from God. 
I want you. I need you. I'm setting aside time. I'm cracking open the Bible, and I'm listening, and I'm praying and saying, God, speak to me for my family. Speak to me about my future. When you passionately pursue God in that way, he will be found. He wants to be found. And it reminds me so much of the verse that we often quote, and it has so much more meaning when you understand the context. It's, it, it's a promise that God made when, when the people were captured and taken to Babylon. The, the Jerusalem was about to be broken down, and they, they were being captured. God said, this is because you have turned away from me. But I'm not going to let this punishment go on forever because what I really want is a relationship with you. So God said, I'm drawing the line 70 years, and then I'm going to do some miracles. I'm going to bring you back. Jer in Jeremiah, it's a, one of the uh, prophets that, that was alive when Jerusalem was, um, was captured. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 10 to 14. This is what the Lord says. So this is a promise. Way back before Ezra and Nehemiah, when the walls were being broken down, when the enemy was coming in. The Lord says, you will be in Babylon for 70 years. But then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again. I will. That was a promise of God. And we've just been studying these last couple weeks, last few weeks, how God did that. He kept that promise. Verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. Plans to give you a future and a hope. Verse 12, in those days when you pray, I will listen. So in other words, in those days when you passionately pursue God, I will listen, he said. Verse 13, this is a promise of God. Take this to the bank. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. God wants to be found when you passionately pursue him. He does not want to be silent. He does not want to feel distant. He wants to be so close, closer than the air you breathe. The problem is that we naturally drift away from God. Maybe you feel like your relationship with God is stuck in neutral. Uh, 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 Pastor Shelley and I, we each have different cars, of course. When I get in her car... I am always, it has these, those buttons that you push to, to shift and to park, reverse, neutral, etc. And I just, I'm always in a hurry. I go, bop, bop. I, and I think that I just put it in drive, and I go, Vroom. I'm still in park, baby. <laughs> not, not, so I have to slowly push <laughs> that button. In my car, man, I just smack those things, and I get going. Um, mine has a little stick shift. <laughs> and away I go. Hers, we got to just, mm, yeah, I got to just give it time, do it right. Maybe you feel like your relationship with God is stuck in neutral. Like it's just not going anywhere. It doesn't feel alive. There's no movement. It's not, it's not going anywhere. And I don't know why, because you visit God every Sunday morning. Isn't that enough? But if you just go around the re go through the rest of your week doing your own thing, and you only visit God on Sunday mornings, work, sleep, eat, repeat, work, sleep, eat, repeat. It's easy to live life feeling disconnected from God. That, that, that's what comes. That's the, the natural outflow of that kind of life, disconnected from the tangible presence of God. God is everywhere. You cannot go anywhere God is, is not there. But his tangible presence feels missing sometimes. And maybe it's that you're, you're just kind of stuck in neutral and just not going anywhere with God. Or, or, or maybe it's a different scenario in, in your life. Maybe you feel apprehensive about getting close to God. Maybe you don't really want God to see everything that's going on in your heart or in your mind. So you just kind of keep your eyes down, hoping God won't make eye contact with you. And you try to keep your relationship with God kind of at the surface level. Or maybe a different scenario. Maybe you resent God because you asked him for something and he didn't do it. You prayed for something and he didn't answer it or he didn't answer the way you wanted for sure. Maybe 
God didn't protect you from your pain. Sometimes we go through horrible pain. But the truth is, it takes passionate pursuit on your part to get out of neutral with God. Because God is pursuing you right now. He's been pursuing us since the first people sinned. The, one of the very first things he said when humanity sinned, Adam, where are you? He goes looking for him. God was always pursuing relationship with you and with me. So sometimes you got to take, you got to have a little passionate pursuit to get out of neutral with God. And alternatively, it takes some vulnerability on your part to let God in. But when you do, you, you'd, and when you, when you see what God's word says about how he feels about you, you realize that God loved you while you were still a sinner. Before you took one step towards God, he loved you. Before you were born, he loved you. God loves you right now. He's not waiting for you to finally measure up so that he would love, forgive, and accept you. He loves you right now. Always did, always will. And when you are vulnerable with God and you invite him into every corner of your life, you will discover, ah, I didn't need to be afraid. I didn't need to be ashamed. God loves me. And when you let him in, you let God's love in. We got to realize Thinking about the third scenario, this life is hard, very hard for some, but this life is not all there is. That's good news. Right now, God redeems your difficulties, and the Bible says they are making you perfect and complete, needing nothing. I love what the Apostle Paul, one of the early church leaders, wrote, and it's written down in 2 Corinthians 4.18. So we don't look at the troubles we can now see. We don't focus there. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now, the troubles, the pains, the injustice, all that's going to soon be gone. But the things we cannot see like heaven and life with God forever, that goes on forever. So we fix our eyes on that. Uh, th this week, just driving in the car, I had Christian radio on, and a, a song came on, and it immediately caught my attention. It's called What I Really Need by Brian Fowler. It's such a great song. And the chorus, this line caught my attention so much. We need truth instead of answers. So many times... We're saying, God, I demand to know why this happened in my life. Why did you let this happen? I want answers, God. But what we need is truth. Because when you know the truth that God loves you and he is causing everything to work out for your good, that truth is enough. And that truth gets you through the pain. Some of you have shared with me some of the pain that you're going through, and it is intense. And I hope I can encourage you today to passionately pursue God. And I just love this. We need truth instead of answers. We need faith instead of sight. We need trust when we can't find the reasons why. We need to actually just trust God. We need to trust his goodness, trust his care, trust his ability. We need presence over blessings. We, more than God doing stuff for us, we need God. When you have God, you have all you need, whether it's good or bad, in plenty or in want, it says in the Bible. We need promise over proof. We need hope instead of healing in our lives. We think all I need is healing and then I would suddenly be better. But what we need is hope in the one, Jesus Christ. We need hope in him. Hope that he's either going to heal me or he's going to redeem the pain or that ultimately I'm going to be pain-free in heaven. That hope can sustain you. Now, God does heal. God does change things. 
in an instant. But what we need is Jesus. That's what we need, no matter what you're facing. So I want to ask you this. I want, I, I, we, we are, we're a very practical congregation, man. We're, we're not going to just hear it and go, hey, man, that was nice. What's for lunch? We're going to hear it and apply it because we live and love the Bible, as it says right there on the wall. We live it. We live the Bible. So I want to ask you, will you passionately pursue God and get your relationship with him out of neutral? Will you be vulnerable to God and let him into every part of your heart and life? Will you look past your troubles of today and fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher, the, the, the initiator and perfecter of your faith? Would you stand to your feet? And I, I, I want to ask you to do something uh, uh, bold. Bold. I'm going to ask you to engage. And so I want to invite you to just simply come to the front as a, as a physical step out of where you are to passionately pursue God. It's not a magic place like here or there. That's not, that's not the point. The point is taking a step to say, God, I am taking a step towards you. I'm getting out of neutral, or I'm being vulnerable, or I'm going to put my hope in you instead of my healing. I'm going to put my trust in you. I'm going to fix my eyes on what you got for me. And so what I love to do, we'll, we'll worship some, we'll pray, but whatever you've got to do, would you just engage with God? The people that we read about today, they lifted their hands and worshiped. Some of them bowed, literally, and maybe, maybe God will just sort of move you to do that, where you just bow with your face to the ground. And you just say, God, I'm, I'm surrender. I, I'm, I'm tired of trying to run my life my way. Would you do whatever you got to do to engage with God, to passionately pursue him? Shout, whisper, be quiet, kneel, uh, jump, worship, but let's passionally pursue him. Why don't you lead us, Pastor Shelley? I'm wholly surrendered, Lord, do what you will in me. Just make me your vessel, your life as an offering. I'm wholly surrendered, Lord, do what you will in me. Just make me your vessel, this life as an offering. Because you can have it all, God, you can have it all. You can have it all, God. You can have it all. You can have it all, God. You can have it all. You can have it all. You can have it all. You can have it all, God. You can have it all. You can have it all, God. You can have it all. You can have it all, God. You can have it all. You can have it all. Surrendered, Lord, do what you will in me. Just make me your vessel, this life as an offering. I'm wholly surrendered, Lord, do what you will in me. Just make me your vessel. So this life as an offering Cause you can have it all, God You can have it all You can have it all, God You can have it all You can have it all, God You can have it all You can have it all You can have it all You can have it all, God You can have it all you can have it all, God. You can have it all. You can have it all, God. You can have it all. You can have it all. You can have it all. Pour out your spirit on our praise. Come, let revival fill this place. Stir up our faith for greater things. Lord, we ask, we Jesus. 
knock on the door, it will be open to us. And Lord, this morning, we as a congregation, we have come in unity to say we want more of you, Lord. We're pursuing you, God. Nothing else will satisfy, God. That car we won't, won't want won't satisfy. That better job won't satisfy. You are the one who satisfies. And so we surrender our desires. We surrender our future, our past. We surrender everything to you, Lord God. And we want you. We want you, Lord. We want your presence. Fill up our lives with your presence. Lord, when we leave this, uh, this place today, may we be so filled with you that we want more. May we continually hunger and thirst for you because your word says we will be filled. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray right now for the person that feels stuck in neutral. They, they're fine with you, but there's no passion. There's no love. There's no, there's no oomph. There's no movement. Lord, I pray, get us out of neutral, Lord God, and, and meet us where we are. Break through. Break through our, any apathy, any indifference we have. Break through, Lord God, and come and invade our lives in a powerful way. May we be changed in your presence, Lord God. Lord, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, for the person who feels like they, they um, don't want to be vulnerable with you. Maybe they've been hurt in other relationships, or maybe they feel guilty or ashamed of who they are. Lord, I pray you break shame off our lives right now in Jesus' name. Break it off, break it off, break it off. Replace it with confidence and boldness in you, Lord God. Lord, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, we get past this lie of the enemy that we're not worthy of your presence or that we're too simple or bad for your presence. You came to seek and save the lost. You're seeking us right now. You want to be with us, Lord. And so, Lord, we make room for you, Lord God, and we're going to trust you right now. Some of us right now are taking a vulnerability step, and we're saying, God, you know that fear. You know that lust. You know that ambition. You know that pride. You know that thing that's going on in the side of, inside of me. You know that I feel like I have imposter syndrome where I'm, I'm supposed to be like the best mom for my kids or I'm supposed to be the best worker and I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. Lord, you know that, you know that and we're letting you in right now. We're cracking the door and say, come in, come in, Lord. Come into that. Come in and bring your presence. And Lord, I pray for the person who's prayed and prayed and, and you didn't answer. They asked for something, you didn't give it to them. I pray for the person who prayed for protection and they were still abused. We live in a sinful world where people are not obeying you, God. And sometimes people do bad things to us. But I know this, Lord God, you too were abused, Jesus. You are the King of kings, you are the Son of God, and they said you're a devil. They, they, they put nails in your wrists and your feet and hung you on a cross. You were abused. You didn't deserve it. But, but God brought something good out of that abuse. And Lord, right now I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, for the person who's gone through very difficult pain. I pray for the person who's gone through abuse. Right now, Lord, I just pray you would come in. And as we passionately pursue you right now, I pray you would come in that you would begin to heal those wounds, Lord God. Heal those wounds in our hearts and our minds. We may never forget, but I pray that you would take the sting away. Lord, I pray you would give us the ability to forgive whoever has hurt us in our lives. Lord, I know people are going through other kinds of things, other kinds of pain as well. And, and Lord, we prayed. We prayed for that healing. We prayed for that situation to change, and it hasn't happened yet. Well, Lord, today we passionately pursue you and we leave the situation in your hands and we trust you. Lord, we, we, need, we need truth, not answers. That we need you. And so, Lord, we passionately pursue you. Lord, I pray right now, Lord, that when, when we leave this place of prayer today, that we wouldn't leave you, God, but that we'd keep pursuing you. 
Lord, I pray that, uh, that prayer before lunch today would be different than it usually is. That, it would, that we'd go beyond, thank you for this food, Lord, but that we would engage you and we would say, Lord, I want you in my life. I want you in my family. Thank you for this food. But Lord, thank you for your presence even more. We're hungry and thirsty for you. Lord, I pray that today we would be changed and that we keep pursuing you because you promised, Lord, and we are holding you to your word. You promised if we wholeheartedly seek you, we would find you. Lord, I pray for the person that feels like you've just been silent for a while, God. Lord, I pray that today would be our breakthrough day, that we begin hearing you, that when we, we crack open your word, it's more than words on a page, but God, you speak to us. When we pray, it's not just silent, but we actually hear you encouraging us in return. Lord, I pray for breakthrough today, Lord God, in hearing you. Lord, revive us, each individual, one at a time, and the whole church, Lord. Revive us, Lord God. Revive us. Revive us, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord, that you are, you are igniting passion in us. You are igniting passion in us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You're igniting passion in us. Thank you. We pursue you. You're the one we want. You're the one we want, Lord. You're the one we want. Hallelujah. 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 I, I don't know where you're at with God, but I can tell this. Everyone in our church came forward. I don't know if I've ever seen that. And I am really encouraged. We've got some Kleenexes right here. If you need them, just catch Pastor Christian's eye. We'll share them, maybe pass them around a little bit. I don't know where you're at. But the fact that you came forward tells me you are seeking God. If you have not yet put your faith in Jesus, then let's do that right now. That's, that's where you got to start in passionately pursuing him. And how many of you have put your faith in Jesus? You know, I have put my faith in Jesus. I'm a Christian. You know. You can know too. You can know. How, how do you put your faith in Jesus? Turn away from your sin. Turn your life over to Jesus. Say, I'm giving you my life and let him start leading you. Do you want to do that today? If, if you're already a Christian, you, you don't need to do this prayer again. But if you're coming to Jesus today, if you're putting your faith in him, I want to encourage you, don't leave today without doing that. That's the most important thing. Don't, don't leave this, this service online until you put your faith in Jesus. All right, so we just want to support you in a, in a prayer to put your faith in Jesus. If you haven't already done it, you got to do that now very important. Tomorrow is not guaranteed, so now is the day of salvation. Now is your time, all right? So we're going to just pray with you, and I'm just going to coach you in a prayer, but if today you want to put your faith in Jesus, you want to become a Christian today, would you just raise your hand, either right where you are in this room or online, both? That's so great. People are putting their faith in Jesus, and I know for some it's kind of a progressive journey. I am so glad you're raising your hand today, and Jesus sees you, he loves you, just as you are. But he's not going to leave you there, right, Jordan? He's going to take me on. He's going to take you on. He's go, we're, gonna, we're going forward. That's right. We're going to pray this together, but if you raise your hand, if you're putting your faith in Jesus today, would you pray this straight to Jesus? Let's go out loud. Jesus, I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. And make me new. I choose to follow you, to let you lead, to be your apprentice, starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Woo! Welcome to the family of God. Welcome to the kingdom of God. Stay where you are for just a second. Pastor Christian's going to close us out, and then we'll all just be able to go on to the next thing together. But why don't you wrap it up for us, Pastor Christian? Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Garrett. If you seek him, you will find him. If you seek him wholeheartedly, if you seek him with all of your hearts, and you guys have sought him today, and I believe many of you have found him. Keep seeking him. Keep finding him as you go out into this week. Amen. Amen. We love you guys. We love you so much. God loves you so much. Well, um, oh man, I just want to stay here. <laughs> 
well, eventually we will need to go. So um, as you leave, if you could put your connect cards in the box, that'd be great. And if you if you accepted Jesus today or recently, we want to walk alongside you in that. And so please stop by the Following Jesus booth. It's the table. It's right out in the lobby. We have a free gift for you. It's a book and a course, Steps on How to Follow Jesus. Come speak to me. I'll be at the table, and um, we'll get you set up on that. We love you guys. And um, also, if we could have your help after service right now, this is another way to worship God, <laughs> is to stack chairs and cover them with plastic so they don't get covered with dust. Uh, we, we could use all of your help. That would be so great. The many hands make light work, and then we'll get out of here as soon as possible. All right, we love you. See you next week. God bless.